It is important to note that serial killers are a relatively rare phenomenon and the vast majority of murders are committed by individuals who only kill one person. However, the crimes committed by serial killers have a profound impact on society and leave a lasting impact on families and communities. I hope you will pray for everyone who has lost someone dear to their heart. And to pray for every victim. I wish you a happy life. Let's continue the stories now. 5. Dayton Rogers Rogers was convicted in 1989 of killing six women two years earlier. Since then, the court has three times struck down death sentences imposed on him. On Friday, his attorneys in closing statements asked for the jury to grant him life in prison, saying Rogers is humiliated and full of shame and that he is not a danger to people in prison. The prosecution had asked for the death penalty, saying Rogers is a danger to people both inside and outside of prison, and that his victims and their families deserve justice. Prosecutors pointed out that the former Canby lawnmower repairman tortured, stabbed, and mutilated his victims, dumping them in a forest near Malala in Clackamas County. Seven victims were found at that site. One of them was finally identified in 2013. Before that murder case, he was also found guilty of murdering a woman whose body was found in 1987 in the parking lot behind an Oak Grove Denny's restaurant. The Oregon Supreme Court struck down Rogers' death sentences in 1992, 2000, and 2012. The first time was to comply with a U.S. Supreme Court ruling that invalidated Oregon's death penalty law. In 2000, the Oregon High Court ruled that the jury incorrectly considered only the options of death and life in prison with the possibility of parole. There should have been a third choice, life without the chance of parole. In 2012, the justices said jury selection was done improperly and the judge incorrectly allowed evidence of Roger's gay experiences as a teenager. Though it is rare to have four separate sentencing trials, it's not unprecedented. For example, Randy Lee Kuzik was sentenced to death three times for killing a Central Oregon couple in 1987, and each time the penalty was overturned. A jury imposed it for a fourth time in 2010, and it has stuck. Roger's first known attack was at age 18 in 1972, when he stabbed a 15-year-old Eugene girl after taking her to a wooded area to have sex. In 1973, after striking two girls with a soda bottle, he was sent to the state mental hospital. After his release in 1974, Roger's crimes continued for more than a decade. At his 2006 sentencing trial, Rogers argued that he was changed a man after nearly two decades in prison. There is never a day that I don't struggle from the very core of my heart and soul over the despicable acts I've committed, Rogers said. After the latest court proceedings, Rogers' attorneys said they planned to file a motion for a mistrial based on a violation of jury rules. They claimed that the jury foreman posted on social media about the trial. Blog posts were entered into evidence and a judge will decide on a retrial at a later date once the motion is filed. That could mean Rogers would go up for his fourth appeal. Governor Kate Brown announced shortly after taking office early this year that she will continue former Governor John Kitzhaber's moratorium on the death penalty in Oregon. On Saturday, spokeswoman Kristen Granger said, Governor Brown has asked her general counsel to consult various experts, including those directly involved with the implementation of the death penalty in Oregon, and advise her how to proceed. That process is underway. Governor Kate Brown commutes the sentences of all 17 people on Oregon's death row in December 2022. 4. William Reese a jury in Oklahoma has recommended a death sentence for an alleged serial killer who was convicted of kidnapping a woman from a car wash and killing her more than 20 years ago. The jury on Wednesday recommended the death penalty for William Lewis Reese, who was convicted last week of first-degree murder for the 1997 kidnapping and killing of 19-year-old Tiffany Johnston. Formal sentencing is set for August 19. Reese did not testify at his trial but the jury heard recordings of his confessions to police in which he admitted killing Johnston and three other people in Texas, the Oklahoman reported. Johnston, 20-year-old Kelly Cox, 17-year-old Jessica Kane and 12-year-old Laura Smither all disappeared over a four-month period in 1997, after Reese had been released from an Oklahoma prison for previous rape and kidnapping convictions. 
Smithers' body was found shortly after her disappearance, but the remains of Kane and Cox weren't found until 2016, when Reese began cooperating with prosecutors. We're all so happy that he got the death penalty, said Johnston's mother, Kathy Daubry. Even though it helped families in Texas, it was for Tiffany, she said of the verdict. After 24 years and 10 months, this is Tiffany's time. Reese's defense attorney, Jacob Benedict, did not dispute that Reese killed Johnston, but said his client only confessed because a Texas Ranger had promised that prosecutors wouldn't seek the death penalty. A promise he couldn't keep, but still a promise, Benedict said. Gay Smither, the mother of 12-year-old Laura Smither, traveled to Oklahoma for the trial, Houston TV station KPRC reported. Reese still faces charges for her daughter's death in Texas. If we don't have our day in court in Galveston, we can live with it because he's at least held accountable here, she said. The most important thing is we know now for sure there is absolutely no way this man will ever get out. William Reese sentenced to death. Admitted serial killer William Lewis Reese had one last opportunity to apologize directly to the family of the newlywed he abducted from a Bethany car wash and strangled to death in 1997. He stayed silent. No, he said loudly behind a mask when the judge asked him if he wanted to say something. There's an old saying in the law, justice delayed is justice denied, Oklahoma County District Judge Susan Stallings then told him. Justice will not be delayed any longer in this case. I sentence you to death. A jury in June decided Reese, 62, should be executed for the murder of Tiffany Johnston. He showed no emotion as the judge sentenced him Thursday morning. He will appeal, his defense attorney announced. He never testified at his trial, but jurors heard hours of his confessions to the killing in Oklahoma and three in Texas in 1997. The victims were all females, the youngest 12. He's not sorry, Johnston's mother, Kathy Daubry, of Anadarko, said after the 15-minute formal sentencing. He's just a serial killer. He doesn't care about anyone but himself. She also said she will never forgive him. Never. I'm sorry, Daubry said. I believe in God and all that but I will never forgive him. And I'm glad people can. But not this mama. Reese began confessing in 2016 from a Texas prison after being linked to the Oklahoma cold case by his DNA. He eventually revealed where in Texas he buried two bodies with bulldozers. He admitted to first killing Laura Smither, 12, in the Houston suburb of Friendswood. Smither disappeared on April 3, 1997, while jogging. Her body was found later that month in a retention pond. He next killed Kelly Cox, a 20-year-old student at the University of North Texas in Denton. She disappeared on July 15, 1997, after going on a class field trip and locking herself out of her car. Her remains were found at a rice field south of Houston in April 2016. He confessed to raping and killing Johnston after throwing her inside his horse trailer at the Sunshine Car Wash in Bethany on July 26, 1997. The newlywed was 19. He said he dumped her in tall grass off a dirt road. The mostly nude body was found the next day. He admitted to last killing Jessica Kane, 17, of Tiki Island, Texas. She disappeared after leaving a Bennigan's restaurant in Clear Lake, Texas, on August 17, 1997. Her vehicle was found abandoned along the interstate. Her remains were found on March 2016 at a dig site in Houston. Prosecutors alleged at trial that Reese targeted his victims to satisfy his sexual urges. They alleged he lied in his confessions and never revealed his true motive and all the details of each death. And so in a terrifying fashion we are left wondering what really happened to Tiffany Johnston at the hands of William Reese, Assistant District Attorney Ryan Stevenson told the judge Thursday. Evil is the best word that I can come up with, the prosecutor said. Johnston's mother, husband and other relatives sat in the jury box for the sentencing Thursday. Also in the courtroom were Smithers' parents and Cox's mother and daughter. Reese was born in Oklahoma but lived in Texas at the time of the killings. He drove trucks, operated a bulldozer and shoot horses for a living when he wasn't in prison. 
He was charged Tuesday with a new felony, possession of contraband by an inmate. He is accused of having a smuggled pink cell phone in jail in July. We have made great strides to keep contraband out of the jail, the jail administrator, Craig Williams, said Wednesday. However, like in all corrections facilities, inmates will continue to seek ways to get a hold of contraband. We need to stay vigilant and alert in our efforts. William Reese is being held in Texas however he is under a death sentence in Oklahoma. 3. Arthur Shawcross Eric Chris, a spokesman for the New York State Department of Correctional Services, told the Associated Press that Mr. Shawcross had been taken earlier on Monday from the Sullivan State Prison in Fallsburg, New York, to a hospital in Albany after complaining of leg pain. The cause of death was under investigation, he said. Mr. Shawcross was arrested on January 4, 1990, a day after the state police spotted him near the frozen body of one of his victims. In the previous 21 months, the bodies of many women nine of them prostitutes who had been working the streets of downtown Rochester had turned up along the banks of the Genesee River and in creeks, gorges, and remote wooded areas of country roads. At the time of his arrest, Mr. Shawcross was on parole after serving 15 years of a 25-year manslaughter sentence for the 1972 strangling of an 8-year-old girl in Watertown, New York. He had confessed to that killing, as well as to strangling a 10-year-old boy in Watertown. But he had not been prosecuted for killing the boy because law enforcement officials did not believe they had sufficient evidence. On December 13, 1990, after a 13-week trial and six hours of deliberation over a two-day period, a Monroe County jury convicted Mr. Shawcross on 10 counts of murder. It was one of the longest and most expensive trials in the county's history. Three months later, in neighboring Wayne County, Mr. Shawcross pleaded guilty to murdering another woman. Throughout his trial for the 10 killings, Mr. Shawcross, beefy and graying, sat virtually still, his shoulders sloped and his head down. In his pretrial confession, he had told investigators that for several years while being married, having an affair and often going fishing he also regularly patronized prostitutes he met in Rochester's Red Light District near Jones Park. He said he had killed one after she bit him, another for being too loud during intercourse, another for trying to steal his wallet, and a fourth for calling him a wimp. The jurors rejected the defense's claim that he was insane at the time of the killings because of brain damage, childhood abuse, and traumatic experiences as a soldier in Vietnam. Arthur J. Shawcross, a serial killer serving a 250-year sentence for strangling, suffocating, or beating to death 11 women in the Rochester area in the late 1980s, died on Monday. He was 63. 2. Dennis Rader Rader was raised in Wichita, Kansas. He later claimed that as a youth he had killed animals and developed violent sexual fantasies that involved bondage. In the 1960s he served in the U.S. Air Force, and in 1970 he returned to Wichita, where he married and had two children. He held various jobs, including a brief stint as a factory worker for the Coleman Company, a maker of camping equipment. In 1979, he graduated from Wichita State University, where he studied criminal justice. During this time, he began working for ADT, a home security company, and in 1991, he became a compliance officer in Park City, Kansas. Rader was active in his church, and he served as a Boy Scout leader. On January 15, 1974, Rader committed his first murders, strangling four family members, including two children, in their Wichita home, the mother had worked for Coleman. Seaman was found at the scene, though none of the victims had been sexually assaulted. Rader took a watch from the home, and he would acquire souvenirs, often underwear, from subsequent victims. In April 1974 Rader targeted a 21-year-old woman who was another Coleman employee. After breaking into her house, however, he also encountered her brother, who managed to escape despite being shot. Rader fatally stabbed the woman before fleeing. Later that year he wrote a letter detailing the January murders and saying that the code words for me will be, bind them, torture them, kill them, BTK. He left the note in a book at the Wichita Public Library, and it was eventually recovered by the police. Over the next two decades, Rader killed five more women. 
His sixth victim was strangled in March 1977 after he locked her three young children in the bathroom. Following the death of his next victim in December 1977, Rader grew irritated by the lack of media coverage. In a letter to a local TV station, he wrote, How many people do I have to kill before I get a name in the paper or some national attention? The resulting coverage helped set off a panic. Rader then waited eight years before murdering a neighbor in her home in 1985, he reportedly later took her body to his church, where he photographed her in bondage. A 28-year-old mother of two was killed in 1986, and in 1991 Rader committed his last murder, strangling a 62-year-old woman in her secluded home. The cases subsequently went cold. In 2004, on the 30th anniversary of Rader's first murders, a local paper ran a feature in which it speculated that the killer had either died or been imprisoned. Rader responded by sending various evidence from his ninth murder, notably a copy of the victim's driver's license as well as photographs of her body, to a reporter. For the next year, he sent packages to the media or simply left items around Wichita. He often used cereal boxes, possibly a reference to serial killer, to hold drawings, crime souvenirs, including photographs, written descriptions of the murders, and even dolls, posed to mimic the various deaths. In January 2005 police received a break after recovering a cereal box that included a note in which Rader asked police whether they would be able to trace a floppy disk he wanted to send them. Through a classified ad, law enforcement officials indicated that it would be safe. He then sent them a disc, which the police quickly traced to his church, where he served as president of the congregation. Rader's DNA was then matched to the semen found at the first crime scene. He was arrested in February 2005, and he soon confessed to the crimes and expressed shock that the police had lied to him. In June Rader pled guilty, and two months later he was sentenced to ten consecutive life terms. 1. Alfredo Prieto Alfredo Rolando Prieto was executed by the state of Virginia on Thursday, October 1, 2015. He was pronounced dead at 9.17 p.m. at the Greenville Correctional Center in Jarrett, Virginia. Alfredo was 49 years of age. Alfredo was executed for the rape and murder of 22-year-old Rachel A. Raver and the murder of 22-year-old Warren H. Fulton, 3. They were last seen alive on December 4, 1988. Their bodies were discovered two days later in Fairfax, Virginia. Alfredo has spent the last seven years of his life on Virginia's death row. Alfredo was born and spent part of his childhood in El Salvador, which was in the midst of a civil war. By the time Alfredo was a teenager, he and his family were living in California, where Alfredo became a member of the Pomona Northside Gang. On December 4, 1988, two Georgetown University students, Rachel Raver, and Warren Fulton were seen leaving a local restaurant in Washington, D.C. Two days later, their bodies were discovered in a deserted area near Reston, Virginia. Investigators determined that Warren was shot in the back of the head and Rachel was shot while trying to escape. As she lay bleeding to death, Prieto raped her. Prieto then fled to California. In 1990, 15-year-old Yvette Woodruff was raped and murdered in Ontario, California. Prieto was charged and convicted of her murder. He then received a death sentence in 1992. While in prison in California, Prieto's DNA was entered into a national database. In 2005, his DNA was matched to a cold case in Virginia, the rape and murder of Rachel and the murder of Warren. Prieto was extradited to Virginia to stand trial. He was convicted and given two death sentences, along with various prison terms for charges related to the murders. Through DNA evidence, Prieto has also been linked to the rape and murder of 24-year-old Veronica Tina Jefferson in Arlington, Virginia in May of 1988, the murder of 27-year-old Manuel F. Sermeno in Prince William County, Virginia in September of 1989, the rape and murder of 19-year-old Stacy Segrist and the murder of 21-year-old Tony Genuzzi in Riverside County, California in the spring of 1990, and the murder of 71-year-old Lula Farley and 65-year-old Herbert Farley, which also occurred. In the spring of 1990, in Riverside County, California, ballistic evidence is also linked to several of the crimes. 
this is where our stories end today. I hope you pray for the victims. I also hope that you will subscribe to the channel and hit the like button. Thank you for watching. I wish you a wonderful life.